to working class women as to how to be wives and mothers who could serve the needs of the company. Generally, EJ workers came to the factories from a farming background. Some were drawn from the region's rural areas of Pennsylvania and upstate New York. Others came from Eastern European rural areas, driven to immigrate as the American grain invasion led to the consolidation of farms and their displacement. <coughs> Johnson had built his factories away from the union-infested area of Binghamton. His state-of-the-art shops were structured for low-skilled workers, in part to reduce costs and in part to allow him to avoid having to hire the historically more militant craftsmen. Johnson was faced with, with what Gramsci called a heterogeneous workforce, many of whom were new to wage labor. How was he then to pull together these former farmers from different parts of the world into a cohesive profit-making force? Written publications, the ideal way to constantly and consistently come into workers' homes. The review consists of material of memorials to fallen soldiers and honors returning veterans, has pictures and treatises of various recreations provided in part or whole by Johnson or EJ, child rearing information, pictures and information about various workers' families, poetries, quips, a George's own page, and letters from workers extolling the benefits and virtues of working for EJ. Every issue also has the homemakers page, the future EJ workers department, and the Little Mother's League, and I will examine the work done in each of these in turn. The language of hegemony is illuminating here. George F's strategy occupied every element of the web of life in the triple cities, including vocabulary. As world ecologists, we know that in order to change the way people think, we need a new set of vocabulary to talk about the processes and the relations. At a very basic level, I think Johnson understood the importance of words. He named his first factory the ideal factory because it was his aim to create an ideal town full of happy, satisfied workers living in ideal homes, playing at ideal parks, reading at ideal libraries, and working in ideal factories. Monuments and institutions were named accordingly. The company was E.J. Shoes. When Johnson built a golf course for the town, he named it Enjoy Golf. Of course, it's you know, pronounced enjoy, but spelled with a hyphen, E-N hyphen J-O-I-E, golf, because the hyphen will help people to think about the E and the J of E-J, as well as his philo philosophy that wholesome activities outside the factory led to honest and industrious workers inside. Johnson's philosophy was summed up in the term the square deal. This is shorthand for the just and honorable deal or agreement between labor and capital. Johnson believed that if the company treated labor fairly and with respect, seeking a profit but not so large of a profit that the wages of the workers were too small, that the workers had benefits better than those found at a union shop, then there would be no discord. When I talk about the ideal this, or the EJ family, or the square deal, I'm using the vernacular of the time and place as introduced and popularized by Johnson and EJ in no small part through various publications. Johnson needed to simultaneously create factories, supply them with a the workforce, and make a town that would provide the means to recreate the workforce day to day and week to week as well as generationally. Johnson built houses for his workers, thus creating the new industrial wife who in turn transformed the houses into homes, making themselves home makers. The process was constitutive and dialectical. In the late 19th century, he chose to build the new shoe factories away from the urban center of Binghamton, where the unions had a hold in the cigar factories. His goal was to, to develop the ideal community where workers could build homes around the factory and walk to work. He saw his vision unfolding close to Binghamton in the middle of an agricultural farm where he could plan every street, factory, and home. He named it Endicott after his partner without whose capital investment the company would have closed. The EJ home buying program was a key element of controlling the workers. He built homes on tracts of land in West Endicott, North Endicott, North Endicott and Johnson City. 
This particular benefit was available only to married men with children. Those who need not apply included single workers of either gender, married men and women with no progeny, married women EJ workers whose husbands were not EJ workers, regardless of the number of children that they might have. Publicly, the program was open to all EJ workers. In reality, the program sought to give homes to applicants who are the right kind of people, those who are not unionists or laggards. The primary concern here is loyalty. Loyalty, of course, is code for non-union. Johnson wanted to fill those homes with families headed by content workers whose compliancy was predicated on their need for job stability and security. Once approved, a worker did not get the next available home. He got the next available home in the appropriate area according to ethnicity. Johnson used the home program to segregate the workers outside the factory floor. The era of monopoly capital saw the segregation of workers by skill level on the factory floor, known as Taylorism. The historically militant skilled laborer was kept distant from the less assertive low skill. Not only did Johnson's new factories reflect this philosophy, he extended it into the daily lives of his workers. Ethnic segregation by neighborhood was reinforced through generous donations of land and money to the various ethnic denominations of Christian churches. Workers who worship together might unionize, better to keep their gods segregated as well. Successful applicants found themselves living in a single family residence with a low mortgage. Compared to the company homes available to coal miners just to the south in Northeast Pennsylvania, the homes were extraordinary. The architecture of EJ Homes was a variation of a bungalow, four square, and homestead styles. The siding was clapboard, shingles, or stucco. The paint, which was also sold by EJ, was called leather coat and was made from a leather byproduct from the shoe factories. The houses were functional, but substantial, and economical to maintain. A typical EJ house footprint measured 22 feet by 24 feet, had hardwood floors, and four to eight rooms. Johnson discouraged workers from having a car and a garage for their homes. He advocated instead to have a large garden to quickly pay off the house to avoid the unnecessary expense of a car. All of these homes were within walking distance of the EJ factories. Immigrants were equally approved for home ownership, although home location was rigidly placed along ethnic lines, as were their job placements. Italians were segregated to North Endicott, Poles and other Eastern European immigrants were located in Johnson City, and white U.S.-born workers were placed in West and South Endicott. There were no black workers to speak of. Indeed, there were very few black residents in the area. The houses in both neighborhoods were de designed by the same architects, built with the same workers who used the same quality materials. The homes were essentially the same. However, the neighborhoods were not. In North Indicott, the Italian district to this day, it is physically segregated from the rest of Indicott, first by rail tracks and second by topography as it sits atop a steep hill. It was also home to the highest concentration of EJ tanneries. Working in the tanneries was bulwark, requiring strength and cooperation at each stage of turning hides into leather, defleshing, running them through the washing wheels, unhairing, soaking, tanning. The Italian workers were exposed to chemicals from high concentrations of salt, lime, and various tanning agencies, agents. <clears throat> the chemical residue flowed untreated from the tanneries into the local creeks and waterways, like Brixis Creek that flows right through Little Italy. The tanneries' noxious smells permeated the Italian neighborhood. North Indicott was the least desirable of the various residential neighborhoods built by the company. West Indicott sits in sharp contrast. Sitting along the picturesque Susquehanna River, this neighborhood, populated by white US-born workers, is located far enough from factories to mitigate the smells and sounds of the manufacturing process. In addition to houses, this is the first neighborhood to receive parks, a swimming pool, a golf course, the aforementioned enjoy golf course, fire station and school, the George F. Johnson Grammar School, 
which was featured prominently in company housing brochures and lauded as the most up-to-the-minute and completely equipped school building in this section of the state. Johnson donated land lots to several churches promoted in the brochures at, to reassure residents that the religious side of life is amply cared for. The home building project allowed Johnson to foster a stable workforce. He only approved workers who were loyal company men, unlikely to look to unions. Homeowners are, and I quote, a steady, industrious, intelligent lot of men. Such a class of men and women are a blessing in any community. And in 1919, a letter published in a local newspaper, Johnson urges banks to make it easier to borrow money for home buying. There can be no security, there can be no guarantee of prosperity and industrial peace except through homes owned by the plain citizens. I myself believe that the home is the answer to Bolshevism, radicalism, socialism, and all the other isms. You will find that the home is the basis of all security. Let's try to work out a plan whereby we can build a lot of homes right here in Endicott. Let the bank be the real friend of all the people through the building of homes. For the workers, the EJ Home Program was the only way that they could have attained this all-important symbol of the American dream. This was repaid not only in mortgage payments, but also in a deeper embedded loyalty to the company. And finally, this was fundamental to the creation of a strata of elite among the working class in the Triple Cities. Gramsci argues that the elite strata of the working class serve two functions. They set the standard for workers. And, on the other hand, they act by example to discipline the non-elite of the class. The EJ Worker Review and the EJ Worker Magazine were paramount in making public these elite families who simultaneously laid out the, ex while simultaneously laying out acceptable and approved norms of the community along every strand of the web of life. The workers' publication prominently featured EJ Homes. Each piece about an EJ home is not just about the home. It is about the worker, his wife, who might also be a worker, and their children, all serving as an example of what can be accomplished if one works hard. Each issue of the EJ Worker Review had five to a dozen bits about workers and their homes. Many featured photographs. All tell the reader about how long the homeowner has been working at EJ, in what capacity and which factory building. Always, the woman is mentioned in her role as mother, along with the number of children. If she works at EJ, that is also included. But these blurbs make a point of including how long the working class family has owned its home, thus setting the normative time frames between the onset of EJ employment and home ownership. Della Penta and his wife live at 201 Odell Avenue in Endicott. They have eight children, four of whom are married, living in Endicott, and connected with the EJ family, happy family. Of the other four, two daughters live at home and work in the Endwell stitching room, while the youngest are in school, no doubt the George F. Johnson Grammar School. This Italian family was slotted into Little Italy in North Endicott. This is an example of what thrift and integrity will accomplish. Another example of what close application will do and what may be accomplished from the opportunities which we as workers have is shown by the illustration of the home of George Bellow, 124 Hill Avenue, Endicott. Bellow, an immigrant from Austria-Hungary, immigrated 30 years ago, been married for 25 years, a member of the EJ Happy Family for 12 years. They have seven children. Two of the daughters are now married, but are still employees of the EJ Happy Family as are all the rest of the children, except for the two school-aged ones. The De Gennaro family were able to purchase a three-family home after being part of the EJ Happy Family for less than six years. While they only have two boys, this is still an example of what may be accomplished in a short time by the opportunities afforded us and by careful li living. No, the us here <coughs> are we, the EJ workers. Members of that oh-so-happy family are given opportunities, hand over fist, if we just take advantage of them. It is through careful living that we are able to achieve such accomplishments as owning a three-family home. George F. constantly and consistently chides his workers for being careless with their shekels. In nearly every issue, there's a piece written directly by Johnson, either in 
George F.'s own page, which is always the first page of the issue, or in the form of a reply to a worker's letter. These often extol the virtues of thrift and denounce the vice of waste. Were it not for bad choices, every one of the workers could be as successful as he, George F., who came up from the ranks of the factory floor. He holds up shiny examples, such as the Degeneros, as proof positive. Johnson solidifies his paternalistic hold through these pontifications. The modernist notion at the scale of the family allows for the potential of each household to achieve liftoff and the highest levels of accomplishment, as long as the workers are obedient, compliant, and most important, loyal, which I remind you is code for non-union. In March 1923, George F. writes, the trouble is, you don't save your money. I'm not adding the emphasis. He wrote in italics and underlines all the time. If you did, you would soon be capitalists as well as workers. At the rate of wages you are now earning in our industry and with the surplus and other benefits you share in, you can very soon, if you are wise, have a very large sum of money. Further, the problems are simple but must be solved correctly. Always, there must be fair control. Always, there must be reasonable submission to control. The question of control is clarified on the workers' first day when they are given the pamphlet and EJ workers' lesson in the square day, first lesson in the square deal. It is spelled out in black and white. If you are faithful, loyal, and reliable, you can earn a good living under fair conditions. This company and its directing heads know their business. They know that it is up to them to see that you give them a square deal, which means a fair return for what you receive. Be a gentleman and a good American, and work days, sleep nights. You must accept direction and loyally support the policies of the company. Photographs accompanying these blurbs about the homes sometimes include the male worker or the child, which might be placed on the front near the porch. Rarely is a woman shown. Even so, these pieces become illustrated examples of the possible, the achievable, the dream that could someday be reality for these workers. The worker has achieved this because of his stout loyalty to the company. He is a happy part of the EJ family. And if you, too, are content, you can have an ideal house and an ideal wife with ideal kids. Working class women are more likely to accept courtship overtures from men who are on the employee of EJ in no small part because it is believed that this is the best, easiest, and maybe the only way to own a home and to attain such achievements. Remember, children are a requirement. As explained in the review, Endwell Terrace is a place of ideal homes built for ideal families. In order to become a resident of Endwell Terrace, there must be kitties and plenty of them in the family. And so, a woman's prosperity was made more likely through marriage and children. Marriage to an EJ man, that is. Children who will be future shoemakers. The homemaker's page was full of advice and instruction to young wives and mothers about how to run a home and raise children. This was about disciplining the woman who would in turn use a stern hand to steer the children into the EJ family. The hegemony of the visual is telling him. <coughs> I was challenged to find a photograph in any of the 72 issues of the EJ Worker publications that showed women in their role of social reproducer. Photos of women in the publication are women at work or women at play. Women are seen most often bent over sewing machines in the factory or in a group at a parade representing the sales department. Alternately, they were at fancy dinners or luncheons with other women at the Ideal Library or a vast crowd enjoying music at the Ideal Bandstand. I did find one photo of working class women leaving an EJ market with their baskets heavy with produce. The article, of course, is about how wonderful the EJ markets are, which George F. provides as a place for farmers to bring their goods to be purchased directly by the EJ Happy Families. Photos of children were never with their mothers. This served to keep invisible the unpaid reproductive labor day, that women did day in and, and week out, month after year after decade. The, this unpaid work was never illustrated in photographs in the pages of the EJ Workers publications, despite the fact that the publications were rife with photographs. 
Working class women were encouraged to have children in several ways. It was the only way that they could live in an EJ home, it might be the, which might be the only way that they could own their own home. EJ sponsored an annual baby party where women of the working class brought their babies to the park for a grand picnic. The inaugural issue of the EJ Workers Review announced a cash prize for the ideal baby. The following issue, this was canceled on the grounds that everyone believes that their own baby is to be the most perfect. For every infant born in the maternity ward of one of the EJ hospitals, George F. would open a bank account in the child's name with an opening deposit of $4. Later, this was changed to a $10 opening deposit on the child's fourth birthday. This not only encouraged working class women to have more babies, it also told them to do it in the hospitals. Use of the hospitals was one of the EJ benefits that was extolled through the publications, most often in the form of a published thank you letter from a happy worker grateful to have received good, free care. Johnson's efforts paid off. Women in, the, in Endicott had higher birth rates than those in the rest of the state of New York by more than double. In Endicott, it was not unusual for working class women to bear six to 12 children, while their counterpart parts had three to six. There was a cash prize contest at one point to find the largest family. The winner was a woman with 14 children. Johnson made certain that there was no doubt as to the role these children had. They were the future EJ workers. Newborns, toddlers, and school-aged children adorned the pages of the publication. It appears that no request for inclusion was denied as the EJ Workers Review routinely was 80 pages with dozens of photographs of children. Each had the child's name, age, and their daddy's name. The piece included his job and building of EJ, where he worked in EJ, how often, how, and often how long they were part of the EJ happy family, and only as applicable, the mother's job at EJ. Otherwise, the mom was not mentioned. The pages of this department were a ripe opportunity for Johnson to once again 